Hey, hello and welcome everybody to today's workshop. I'm really excited to do this workshop with you because there has been a massive bill that's been passed, the largest spending bill of all time. And I'm really excited to go through with you and help you understand the intricacies of this um, and really try to do it in a simple way, right? So my name is Jason Hamilton. I'm the founder of Keep It Simple Financial Planning. And we're all about taking complex concepts and then breaking them down to a simple form so that you can understand them, you can act on them, and then you know what to do and how to maximize your situation depending on what's going on. So you may have heard there's been a uh, massive bill passed called the CARES Act, and there is a lot of aid coming to America right now in, in our troubling time of just a lot of uncertainty, to be honest, right? I think there's just so much uncertainty right now and people are very concerned about what could happen. And we probably haven't even faced the worst of what's going to happen with this, uh, you know, COVID-19 or also known as the coronavirus. So I hope you all are out there healthy, still doing well, you know, really appreciating the time that you're getting to spend with your families um, and, and your loved ones, even though you may not be able to be, you know, in the same room with them. Hopefully you're taking advantage of things like Zoom. Uh, we have a uh, bi-weekly uh, we meeting now with my family on Zoom. So tonight at 7 p.m., we're going to do a meeting together. And I recommend that you, uh, if you're feeling a little bit isolated, then you definitely take advantage of that because it's just a wonderful way to interact with other people and um, check in on people and just see how everybody's doing to make sure you know everyone's staying healthy and well and, and they don't need anything. Because the last thing we want right now is you know people being out there and feeling like they can't get what they need. So um, what we try to do in the group here is help people uh, get resources. So if you haven't yet, you can check under the announcements tab. And under the announcements tab, there's there was a hundreds of people that had put their information there, you know, just where they're located, what type of supplies they have. And so if you're in need and, um, you know, the area around you is running short on any type of supplies, food, you know, of course, the... Uh, the uh, toilet paper and hand sanitizer, those things are of high value these days. But there was hundreds of people that uh, reached out and said, hey, I'm willing to help if anybody needs it. So, you know, if you are in need of anything, go to the announcements tab, check that out. And there's, you know, a few hundred people there that um, are willing to help if needed. So, you know, I, I think we might be a little bit early. We might still have, you know, uh, a little bit more time until people are getting there. But again, I'm just hoping everybody's staying healthy staying away from all this chaos and just following the rules. You know, it, it can be really tough to stay home at a time like this and isolate, but it seems like that's the best thing we could possibly do to keep ourselves safe. And many of you here are in that high risk category, right? You're above 60 years old. Some people have pre-existing conditions and that's where the virus is really hitting the hardest, okay? So some young people are getting, um, getting, you know, having problems as well, but the majority are in that 65 plus range. So if that's you, just take the time, spend a couple weeks and try to find the joy in this peaceful time. Uh, maybe find some, you know, eat more at home, eat healthier. You know, going on walks, I think is wonderful, getting outside in nature, but just doing what you need to do so that you don't get caught up in this because it looks like some of the stories are pretty bad if it does go bad. So of course we have many people that are recovering, right? It's like over 90% of people are recovering, um, which is great without too many symptoms. But again, we got to take this seriously. And so, you know, at the end of the day, the the government is trying to do what they can do. And of course, I never want you to rely 100% on the government, but maybe right now is the time you have to do that. So what I want to do is uh, help you understand, you know, what's going on with this uh, new coronavirus bill that could affect you for, as a retiree. Okay, so I know there's tons of information out there everywhere you look, you know, every news site, but uh, I haven't seen anybody tailored specifically to retirees and that's who, you know, we serve. And so I really want to um, make sure we talk about that. I am also going to have another video about, uh, you know, if you've lost your job and unemployment and things like that, and then uh, probably a shorter video on student loans and the, and the, uh, what's the, what's been going on with the bill there and the provisions there. But I just don't think that applies to most people and we have a lot to cover. So I really want to make sure we're focusing on retirees here. And then I will again, uh, make a couple more videos, one for those that are unemployed or facing maybe a foreclosure in their home. And then uh, a separate video for those that are dealing with student loans because there's some, some things there that the government has stepped in to do. So without further ado, let's jump in a little bit to what we're going to talk about today. And uh, again, you know, uh, when I posted for questions, I think there was over 200 questions uh, about this bill. And I think I'm going to answer most of those today. So if I don't answer your questions, I'm going to make time at the end for Q&A. So go ahead and put your questions down in the chat. 
and I'll pull it on the screen if I can, and we'll talk about your particular question. But I think I'm going to address pretty much everything I saw in there in our in our discussion today. So hopefully you find this useful. Okay, so let's just jump right in and just start discussing some of this stuff here. Okay, so. If this is not coming through, let me know in the comments, but it looks like everybody is able to see it okay, which is wonderful. Um, and let's see here. Yep. Okay. I'm getting people saying they can hear it and that it's coming through. Wonderful. Um, and for Tom, yes, you will, will be able to watch a replay. Okay, Tom, the, the replay will be here for you um, anytime you want to come back, but the live Q&A is going to be live. So we got to focus on that. Okay. So the CARES Act, you know, how the coronavirus bill could impact your retirement planning. So we're going to talk about that today and give you the best information I can. Before we jump in though, I do have to let you know that you know this should not be taken as legal, tax, accounting, or financial advice. I still want you to reach out to your financial professional or your tax accountant, or if you reach out to us, we're happy to discuss with you. But I have to be careful here and, and make sure that you don't just take my advice on a whim, but I wanna give you some insights here that I think other people aren't really talking about, at least that I haven't seen, um, that can give you a little more in depth than the general articles you're seeing on the big uh, media outlets, okay? So here's what we're going to be covering today. Um, we're going to start with talking about recovery rebates, which is AKA your check, you know, so the money that you're expecting to get, we're going to start with that. Uh, and then we're going to talk about some tax and retirement provisions that are going on with this new bill. Um, we're also going to talk about enhancements to loans from employer plans. So if you're going to need to take a loan from your 401k or 403b, there's been some updates there. Uh, we're going to talk about the provisions around required minimum distributions. And this could be really nice if you happen to be in a little sweet spot um, around that age or if you are taking your RMD. Uh, we're also going to talk about the charitable deductions. This can be this is going to be really nice for those that even if you don't itemize, there's going to be a charitable deduction you can do. So if you want to help out your local church, your local charity, um, there's, there's something they put in there for you. And then we're also going to talk about the health care related rules because there's some updates there that I think will be useful for you. Okay. So um, let's just dive right in. So the thing I want you to know is this coronavirus bill is a massive bill. Um, it just has tons of provisions for consumers and business owners. Um, it's over 800 pages, okay? Um, I read through a lot of it. Um, I didn't read through everything. I really focus on the things that, that apply to my audience here or you, know, you guys here, the retirees. So that's what we're mostly gonna talk about. But I did, um, like I said, I'm gonna do another video on unemployment and um, housing if you're having tr trouble there and then also student loans, but I'm not going to include that today. Um, but we have, what you should know is the bill has been passed by the Senate and the House. It's been signed by the president, so it's all moving forward. Um, it's a $2 trillion bill or up to $6 trillion depending on whether you count certain loan provisions and guarantees. So there's a lot of loan provisions, forgivable uh, loans for business owners and things like that. And again, I'll talk about that in my other video, but it could be up to $6 trillion depending on that. So, you know, the $2 trillion, what you have to realize is that this is about 10% of GDP in a normal year, right? Uh, so it's about 10% of the production we do in the U.S. in a normal year. And this is probably not going to be a normal year, but if you look at previous years, it's about 10%. So it's a big, big, big spending bill, okay? So let's talk about the recovery rebates, <coughs> excuse me, a.k.a. your check. Um, so there's a lot of questions around what this is going to be. Is it going to be considered income? Um, you know, am I going to have to worry about ACA and things like that? Um, the answer is no, it's not going to be uh, perceived as income. It's going to be provided as a refundable credit against your 2020 income taxes. And I'll talk about more about what that means in just a moment here. Um, so about 90% of taxpayers are expected to receive a check of some sort. And what you can expect to receive is about $1,200 for individuals or $2,400 for married couples. And then you're going to get an additional $500 for each child under the age 17. So not 17 and under, it's under the age of seven, uh, 17. So you could say 16 and under, but that's how it's written. So I want to make sure I clarified that. So if you have college students, you're going to get the $500. Um, I've heard some people talking about, you know, should I claim the student on my taxes or not claim the student on my taxes? Honestly, folks, I think you should do the right thing and you should do whatever you're going to do before, not try to manipulate your taxes to get an extra $700, okay? So I think integrity is a really big thing to consider right now. You know, uh, free money is a good thing, but it's never free money. It's coming from our budget. So I think whatever you're previously going to do, if you're going to claim your children, even though one's in college and, and or one may not be, I still think you should do whatever you're doing before, but this is how it's going to shake out, okay? So $1,200 per person, $2,400 for married couples, and an additional $500 per child under age 17. 
Okay, so a refundable tax credit. What is a refundable tax credit? So this is from Investopedia. So a refundable credit is called refundable because the taxpayer can receive a payment from the U.S. government through the IRS it, you know, if the credit puts the taxpayer's liability into negative numbers. So what this means is so there are certain tax credits that are called non-refundable. Okay? And let's say you make you know, relatively low income and you don't really pay tax, you know, or maybe this, uh, this amount of money, if you were to receive $2,400 back um, as a uh, non-refundable credit, this would push you to paying zero taxes this year. Well, the difference between non-refundable and refundable is that refundable credit, you can actually go below zero, right? So you're going to get this either way. There is a limit to the upper side of it, which we'll talk about in a moment. But, um, you know, this differs from the non-refundable credit because the, you know, the non-refundable credit can reduce the taxpayer's liability down to zero, but that's the limit. A refundable credit, like we're talking about here, can go beyond that, okay? So for those of you that are, you know, probably going to get a tax return of some sort, you know, should you consider this an advance on future tax refunds? And I, I would say not really. OK, I would say you should treat this as if it's, you know, if, as if you paid it in, paid in the money already. And the IRS is just giving you back your own money. This, this will not re impact your refund. But if you have a lower income and that you would normally go to zero, you're going to get the additional amount. OK, so there's going to be some people that um, may end up not really getting more money necessarily, but they are going to get money in their hands today versus um, waiting until a tax return comes, you know, next January. Okay. So that's the idea. Okay. So let's talk about phase outs. Okay. So phase outs based on income and what they're going to look for is your AGI. Okay. So if you make $150,000 or below, married to filing jointly, you're going to get the maximum benefit. If you're $112,000 or below if you, and you file ahead of household, you will get the maximum benefit. And for and it's going to be $75,000 for all other file, filers, which is generally single. And so as long as you, if you make that money or less, um, then you will get this credit. Okay. So if you made more than this, you're, there will be a phase out. Okay. And the way the phase out is going to work is that you, um, you will receive $5 less per $100 of additional income you make beyond these amounts here. Okay, so what does that look like? So if you filed, merely finally jointly, and your, and your household AGI uh, was $151,000, instead of, it's $151,000, instead of the $2,400 payment, your payment would reduce by $50 to $2,350. So if you take $5 times 10, because for every $100 you get reduced to $5, and in this case you earn $1,000 more, you can take, um, if you earn $1,000 more, that's 10 times 100, um, which is $1,000 times um, $5, which will be 50 bucks, okay? So you will get reduced if you made above that, but you will probably be getting something. And this is why so many people are going to be getting something because, you know, there's very few families that make above $150,000. Okay, so now we're going to talk about a little bit of strategy, okay? And, you know, if you haven't filed your 2019 tax return... If you've already filed your 2019 tax return, it just kind of is what it is at this point. Um, but there's some things you should you should know. So this this will be for 2020 a refundable tax credit. So it's a little bit backwards here because it's a refundable tax credit for 2020, but it's going to be based on your 2019 return if you filed. Otherwise, it's going to be based on your 2018 return. So if you made less money in 2018, you haven't filed your 19 yet, you might want to take advantage of the delayed filing period which is until uh, July 15th of this year. And that's, um, by the way, that's what it looks like is that's also the delayed time you can con contribute to your IRAs as well um, if you want to do that instead of um, April 15th, okay? So like I said, this is a bit backwards. So if you had higher income um, in 2018, 2019, oh, well, I should say this is a bit backwards if you had higher income in these years and you won 2020. So most people are going to have lower income this year, not everybody, but some people will if you lost your job or you got your hours cut. So like I said, it's a bit backwards. It just kind of is what it is. Um, but if your 2019 was lower than your eight, 2018, um, then you probably want to file sooner, right? So you probably want to file taxes sooner to make sure uh, you, know, you qualify for this whole um, benefit if you did make over that amount in 18, but you didn't in 19, for example. So if not, then you can delay filing if, if you owe. Um, but if you are expecting a, a return in 2019, then I would definitely say file, right? Because you want to get that return money in as soon as possible. You really don't want to delay that if you don't have to delay that. So that's kind of the strategy is like if you, you know, if your 2019 income was lower than 2018, then file sooner. 
If not, then you want to delay filing, you know, if you owe. But if you don't owe, then you want to file now and get that tax return coming in as well, because that's more money you can use to bridge the gap here. So I, hopefully that is clear. And if it's not, let me know. But um, I know it's a little bit tricky. All right. So. OK, so here's an interesting thing, and this is what it looks like so far. And this is what I'm being told when I'm looking, talking with uh, people that are smarter than me, you know, that are more into the tax world than I am. But if your income is expected to be higher in 2020, even if your income is expected to exceed the income limits this year, it looks like you're still going to get to keep the recovery rebate check. OK, so this is good news if you're going to make higher income this year. And you may not qualify based on your 2020 income, but you would on your 19 or your 18 income. It looks like you're still going to get to keep this rebate check. So you're not going to have to worry about paying this back down the road. Um, you should be totally fine if this is the case. So hopefully, um, hopefully, hopefully this is a good thing. Okay. Okay. And when will you get your money? Okay. So I know everybody wants to get their money. Uh, the guidance technically is uh, payments are supposed to be paid as soon as possible. So it could be a few weeks, but if you go back to the last time there was a stimulus, it took a couple months. So you may be waiting until about May to get this, potentially, but you might get it sooner, okay? So I would just plan on getting it by May. Um, ideally, I think that would be a good time, but um, they're trying to get these as soon as possible. So how are you gonna receive it and how can you receive this, uh, this, this money faster? So if you're already receiving Social Security, you'll receive the check wherever you get your Social Security check. So if it's deposited to your account, um, or you receive it by mail, that's where you're going to get the Social Security, uh, you're going to get this um, rebate check. Um, for other people, if you have, if you get your uh, refund in either 2018 or 19 direct deposited to your account, then this check is going to come direct deposited to your account as well. So this is about 50% of taxpayers do this. So you'll get it to direct deposit right to your account. Otherwise, it will be sent to the last address they have on file. So you may be wondering, you know, what if I had moved since then? Well, Jason has an answer for you. So if you closed your bank account since your last deposit, okay, it may take longer to get your check. So this is something you want to do immediately, okay? If you've moved since you last filed um, or closed your account, you want to make sure you update the address with the IRS. So you're going to file form 8822, and I will put the link to this um, in the comments. Okay. So I'll put the link to this in the comments of this video once I'm done here. But um, if you've moved since you last filed and you did not do a direct deposit, so you are most likely going to get your check mailed to you, you want to update your address as soon as possible using form 8822. And again, I'll put the link down in the comments for you. Okay. That's how you're going to address that one. All right. So <clears throat> um, now let's talk a little bit about tax and retirement provisions that are going to be going on with this bill. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about the coronavirus-related distributions for retirement accounts. So this is actually very similar to previous provisions given to Americans in disaster areas. So Hurricane Katrina, things like that, they basically just copy and paste it over what they offered at that time. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, and this is stuff that's done before, so it hasn't been anything. This is not new, by the way. So it'll just be new to you if you never experienced this, but this is not new in the thing in the terms of um, what the IRS has dealt with in the past. So this is actually going to be really interesting, okay? So... Um, this year, and this has to be done in 2020, okay, up to $100,000 total from your IRAs or employer plans can be distributed this year with no penalty, okay? You still got to pay the tax on this, and we'll talk about that in a second. But there's going to be no 10% penalty like there normally would be if uh, you were taking money out prior to 59 and a half, okay? So this is for folks that are below 59 and a half. Uh, so the distribution, like I said, it must be made in 2020, but here's, what's interesting. This could have been made any time in 2020. So even if you made this in January before you knew about all this and you're experiencing a hardship, you may be able to argue and claim that this distribution, um, as a coronavirus distribution. So this is an interesting planning point and it's going to come to how you pay your taxes. Okay. So this is going to be really interesting. So we'll talk about this in um, a little bit more detail here. But before we get to that, there are some, some provisions, okay, we need to talk about. So here, here are some of the things you have to follow, and, and these are pretty broad parameters, but this is what's stated. Um, you had to have been diagnosed with COVID-19, have a spouse or dependent diagnosed with COVID-19, or experience adverse consequences, adverse financial consequences as a result of being quarantined, furloughed, being laid off, or having work hours reduced because of the disease. Um, 
that's, you know, that's pretty much a lot of people, right? Uh, you have to be unable, you know, and this is or, right? So, or unable to work for the lack of childcare as a result of disease. So maybe you were laid off or furloughed or had your work hours reduced, but now you have children at home that would normally be in school and you're unable to work because there's no childcare. This would qualify, okay? Um, if you own a business that closed or operated uh, under reduced hours because of the disease, then you would qualify for this. Or you can just meet uh, some other reason that the IRS decides to say is okay. So what I want you to know is these are very broad parameters for this provision. So you can take up to $100,000 out of your pre-tax accounts with no penalty this year. Um, and, you know, as long as you have some sort of adverse condition based on, on this COVID-19 situation, you should qualify for the special considerations, which we're going to talk about again more here. So benefits. Okay, let's talk about some benefits here. You'll be exempt from the 10% early withdrawal penalty. You will not be subject to mandatory withholding from your employer plan. So here's something interesting, okay? Many of you are taking money from your 401ks and you're following something like the rule of 55, for example. So if you don't know what the rule of 55 is, it means you retired at 55 or later and you're taking distributions from your 401k or workplace plan before 59 and a half, which you normally would have a penalty but since you um, have met those conditions of retiring after 55, um, you can take money out. But those plans generally are going to withhold 20%, right? That's pretty normal. These plans are generally going to withhold 20% of that money. And so if you wanted to take out $100,000 under normal conditions, even if you met some sort of other um, exception, normally you'd have $20,000 of your $100,000 withheld until tax time. You might get a refund at that time, but you'd only see $80,000. Well, now with these provisions, you're not going to be subject to mandatory withholding from your employer plan. Okay, so that's a that's a big change. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, you can actually repay the amount you withdraw to effectively roll back into the account over three years. So you can have three years if you want to get this money back in because you are still working, you are actually experiencing a hardship, not just because you want to get the money out. You're going to have three years to get that money back into the account. So. This is going to be really interesting when it comes to your financial planning on how you want to take advantage of these things, um, depending on what your needs are currently. So I think there's a lot of interesting things here from an advisor's perspective on how to approach this. Uh, so what you need to know is that the three-year clock starts the day after you receive your distributions. Okay. So if you receive a distribution from your account and you know, let's say it's March 29th today and let's say you receive it April 6th. Well, the three-year clock is going to start April 7th. So you're going to have three years from that date to get the money back into your account, okay, if you want to do that. So, um, you know, like I mentioned before, this is still going to be a taxable income, but here's another thing that's interesting. Your, um, the tax you're going to pay on this can be spread over three years. So, for example, you would pay, if you were to take out $60,000, um, you would pay tax on one third of that per year. So you, you would increase your income by $20,000 per year. So this can actually be a really interesting way if you're going to have a, um, you know, a low income year this year, you may not want to take advantage of the three year um, spread, but uh, you know, you can. So, you know, but if you're going to have like a very low income this year, you know, you're not required to take the three year spread. You may just want to pay tax all in 2020 if it's going to be a low income year. So let's say you need to take out, you know, let's say $30,000 just to get you through the rest of the year and you lost your job making, you know, 50 or 60,000 you may not want to add on an additional $10,000 a year if you get your job back and you're now making $60,000 know, next year and then a few years after. You'll pay a lower tax rate to, uh, this year um, if you just took it all in one year. So again, these are some planning things that you really want to talk to with your uh, financial advisor. If you need help with that, let us know. Okay, we can talk with you about that. Um, so you can, you can uh, you have options how to pay this back as well. Okay, so you can pay it back in, in one lump sum. So if you take out the 60K, you want to put it all back at once. Or if you want to make a series of payments, so if you want to do $10,000 every six months, for example, you can do that as well. So whatever works best for you, there's, there's some flexibility here, but you want to make sure that um, you are following the rules here and make sure you're doing the right thing for yourself, okay? So if you are going to do this, especially if you're going to be pulling from a, a workplace provider, you want to call your plan provider and tell them that you're a victim of the COVID-19. So it could be physical or financial. And what it, from what it looks like, they're required to take your word for it. They can't even really question you on, on that. So if, if you're coming, going to be pulling from like a 401k, 403b, 457, where a lot of times they would hold back 20%, 
you definitely want to call and let them know that you're a victim financial, you know, financially from this coronavirus deal. Um, and as long as you obviously are, uh, and they will not, they are not allowed to withhold that additional uh, percentage, whatever it is for your particular plan, but generally it's 20. So this is something you want to be proactive with if you're going to take this. Okay. Make sure you call and let them know, tell them your situation and you have to use, say, Hey, I am a victim of the COVID-19 or the coronavirus situation. I'm a financial victim, I'm a physical victim if you're sick. Um, and they are required to take your word for it is, is what it looks like. Okay. So it's kind of a big deal. All right. Okay. So um, now we are going to talk about enhancements from employer plans. Okay. So you may not want to take a distribution. You may just want to take a loan. And I think there's, it's just, it's kind of going to be a toss up depending on your situation. So you want to run the numbers on this, but there are some enhancements to loans. If you did just want to take a loan and you didn't want to take the whole distribution and then pay tax on that. I think that's kind of the biggest thing is uh, if you were to take a distribution, you're going to owe tax. If you take a loan, you're going to pay it back, but um, you're going to pay yourself an interest rate of some sort, uh, but there's not going to be a big tax bill, you know, this year, next year, the year after. So, um, so the, the things you need to know here are the maximum loan amount has increased. Okay. So normally uh, it's $50,000, but you can now take up to $100,000. Okay. This is from an employer plan. So you can't do this from an IRA. This is from 401ks, 403bs and the sort. Um, and uh, you can now also take up to 100% of the vested balance, okay? So 100% of the vested balance. Previously, it was a greater of $50,000 or 50% of the balance, whatever was greater. So now you can take up to 100% of the vested balance up to $100,000. Um, and then on top of that, payments on the plan loan may be delayed an additional one year than previously allowed, okay? So the government's really trying to make this flexible. They really, uh, I mean, they're putting so many things in place from a housing perspective, from a financial perspective. They're doing a lot to keep our economy from completely crashing. Um, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't fully know. But the stock market, my man, that did come down very, very roughly. And I know a lot of you are freaked out. Hopefully uh, things start, you know, it's a year or so or less of, of the craziness. And hopefully we can get back to normal within the next year or two. But you know, these are some things that the government, I think, is doing a lot to try to be flexible to help us get through this time. OK. All right. So um, for those of you that are dealing with RMDs or requirement of distributions, this this is pretty interesting uh, if you're in certain situations. So what you need to know is RMDs have been waived for 2020. OK, this includes IRAs and employer plans. So here's uh, if you are in a special category where you turned 70 and a half at the second half of 2019 and you're one of those procrastinators that delayed your RMD because you know you have until April to take it, you not only get to waive 2019's RMD, you also get to waive the RMD for 2020. So technically, you don't have to, there's two RMDs that you get to waive that you don't have to take out. So this can really benefit you if you don't want to take your RMD this year, but you were supposed to and you missed the one from, from last year. But for those of you that are required just to take your RMD starting in 2020, um, the RMD requirement is uh, waived. Also, if you're already taking your RMD because you're over 70 and a half, um, then you don't have to take your RMD for this year either. So this will keep your taxable income lower this year, which could be a good thing. Obviously, you still can take a distribution if you want to, but you're not required to. And many, many people don't need the RMD. They just end up taking it and reinvesting it. So this can be a benefit for you to save you some taxes this year. Okay. Um, and then this also suspends RMDs for inherited IRAs as well. So if you inherited a, an IRA from a non-spouse, uh, if you're a non-spouse beneficiary, this also suspends RMDs for you um, in this case as well. Okay. So what if you are, you know, one of those, you know, early bird gets the worm type of folks and you already took your RMD for this year. Okay. So this is going to get a little tricky and a little bit technical. So bear with me. Um, I'm trying to make this as simple as possible because you could possibly put your RMD back in if you've already taken it, but you have to follow some specific uh, considerations here. So got to make sure you're following this stuff here. Okay. This is a little bit tricky. So just bear with me. I did my best to make it simple. Okay. So if you've already taken your RMD for 2020, okay. Um, if it's been within 60 days since you took the distribution to satisfy the RMD, then you can use a 60 day rollover roll and just roll it back into the IRA. So many of you know that if you were to take money out of your IRA, um, you have 60 days to put it in, back in your IRA without any sort of penalty or taxes. So you can just use that rule. Um, a caveat though is, 
if you did a rollover, like you roll over 401k to an IRA within the past year, and you took your RMD there, you cannot roll it back into the IRA. So this would be a violation of the once per year rollover rule. So that's a little tricky. So if you're in that unique situation where you did, you rolled over your IRA within the last 12 months, and you took your RMD now within the last 60 days, or uh, year to date, you cannot put the money back in because that's going to cause a problem. So I would recommend, in this case, you see your tax or financial professional if you're dealing with something like this. But if you did not do a rollover from like a 401k to an IRA, for example, in the last 12 months, and you took your RMD within 60 days, um, you know, then you could put it back in using that 60-day uh, rollover rule. Okay, so if you want to put it back in, so continue to get that tax deferred growth for another year, that could be a good thing. And then the other thing is too, you probably, if you took your RMD out right at the beginning of the year, you probably took it out and then the market crashes. So technically you took out, you know, less shares than you could today when the market's been down. So you could put it back in um, if you like to, and then pull it out again, if you, if you like to get essentially more shares out and, you know, pay less tax in that, in that uh, situation. So, um, you know, if you took your RMD over 60 days ago, um, then if you qualify for a co coronavirus distribution, then you have three years to roll it back in. So you could say that, right? So this is where it starts to get a little tricky, right? And so I'm, I'm, I'm tiptoeing here, guys. I'm tiptoeing here because I don't want to cross the line into giving you advice because I can't give you advice unless you're a client, but I want to give you some good insights and some tips and tricks, um, to help you be a little more strategic when it comes to this stuff. So again, partner with your financial professional, reach out to us do something, just make sure you do this right. Okay. So if you took your RMD over 60 days ago, so let's say you took it January 1st and now you, you're, you can't use that 60 day rollover rule, but you qualify for a coronavirus distribution because maybe your situation for some reason has been impacted of, from those lists uh, of items that I mentioned before, then you have three years to roll the money back in. So you could say that, right? So again, I don't want you to be violating, you know, integrity or anything like that. I don't want you to do anything that would, that is not real, but this is a way you can get that money back in if you're over 60 days, okay? Um, but if you're a non-spouse beneficiary of, of an inherited account, then this will not work. So for an inherited IRA, this is just not gonna work. So, but this, this if it's your own IRA or you're a spousal beneficiary of the IRA, then this would work. You could possibly use that three-year rule to roll it back in. So I know it's a little bit technical. Um, I am gonna send out my slides for those that are on my email list. I'll send those out so you can look at this um, in more detail. But um, hopefully this all makes sense to you guys. Okay. So um, now this is something I think is actually really cool. Um, there is a new above the line charitable deduction. So what does that mean above the line? So this means before, um, so above, let me, how can I make this more simple? So many people now are take standard deduction, right? So about 91% of people take the standard deduction. So I think it's 12, a little bit over $12,000 per person now that you can take the standard deduction. So if you take the standard deduction, you don't itemize. So if you don't itemize, then your charitable contributions typically aren't deductible, right? But there's a new above the line charitable deduction. So what this means is even if you don't itemize on your tax return, you can still make a qualified charitable deduction of up to $300 and get a tax deduction. So I think this is a time where institutions like churches and nonprofits are really going to need help, folks. I mean, this is not a joke. My um, my father-in-law and my mother-in-law are pastors, and it's just kind of scary because they rely on donations, right? But if nobody's coming to church, you know, hopefully they still donate, but they're probably going to see a big dip in, in donations, and many churches will. And so this could be a really nice way to help out your local church if you are charitably inclined and still get your tax deduction for it. So 300 bucks, I mean, it's it's if everybody gave 300 bucks to the church, I think, um, you know, maybe they'll be okay for a little while. So Highly recommend you take advantage of this, whether it's a church or a qualified charity. But what you have to know is this must be made in cash, okay? Not like cash dollars, like you can pay from your debit card or whatever, but you cannot give appreciated stock, okay? Because a lot of people like to give appreciated stock and get that deduction. This is a cash-only um, type of uh, contribution, and you cannot contribute to a donor advice fund. So those don't count either. So if you literally go to the church or the nonprofit's website, you know, go there and you pay by check, um, ACH, you know, debit card, whatever, um, that will be, that should be um, a qualified charitable contribution here for this particular situation, even if you don't itemize, okay? So um, hopefully, you know, if, if you're doing okay, if you're in good shape um, and you can donate $300, then this would be a great way to get a deduction, okay? 
All right, uh, there is also an expanded AGI limit for charitable contributions. So this is for people that are very charitably inclined, okay? So they've expanded the limit for charitable contributions. So typically, you can only contribute up to 60% of your AGI if you're donating cash. It's lower if you're donating other things like, you know, stock or property or whatever um, to a charity and get a deduction. So this year, it's up to 100% of AGI. So if you are somebody who maybe your, um, your AGI is only from a pension, but maybe you have more than you need in your retirement accounts and you like to give away a lot to your local charity or local church or whatnot, um, you probably know that you can only get a deduction up to 60% of your AGI, so you probably would carry it forward after that. Well, this year now, and this is for 2020, you can donate up to 100% of your AGI and, and basically get a deduction on all of that money. So that could be really, really nice. Um, and then anything in excess that you give of 100% of your AGI can be carried forward for five years, right? So this would be a wonderful year to make a big contribution. If you've been wanting to give a big contribution to a church or a local charity, um, this can be a wonderful year to do that because, you know, anything excess of 100% can be carried forward for the next five years. So again, this is time uh, a time for all of us to come together. And I think, you know, if we can give and support each other, support our local businesses, support our local churches and nonprofits. Um, I think that's what this time is about and it should be about versus just running scared and just contracting and um, keeping everything for yourself. You know, if you can do a little bit, I highly recommend you do. I think it'd be nice, nice for you to do that. And, you know, we, we do the same. So I am, um, I do practice what I preach. Okay. All right. Um, let me check in for questions here. See if there's any questions. Not really seeing any questions. So yeah, so someone, uh, yeah, no, we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. So let's talk about healthcare related rules. So this is a good thing as well. If you have like an HSA, an Archer MSA, um, or a, an FSA, so these are health savings accounts or uh, flexible spending accounts to use for healthcare, the definition of medical expenses has been expanded. Okay. So typically over the counter medications are not covered by these plans. Now they are. Okay. So, you know, Eligible expenses are now going to include your over-the-counter uh, medication. So if you need things, um, you can use your HSA money, FSA money. I think that could be uh, a really nice way to purchase it if, if you have the money there. And it also expanded to include menstrual care products for women. So, you know, th these things are typically not covered, but now they're going to be covered for this year. So this will be great if you have to buy these things anyways and you want to use a little bit of your HSA money. That could be a tax-free um, tax distribution, okay? And a couple other notable changes. Um, Medicare beneficiaries will receive no cost COVID-19 vaccine when it's available. Okay, it's not available yet, but when that does come, if you're a Medicare beneficiary, you're gonna get that at no cost when that's available. Um, another big change is if you are on Medicare and you have Part D, you can request now up to a 90 day supply of medication. If you're on Medicare, you're in the plus 65 age group, right? 65 plus, you're in the high risk category. We don't want you going out and being around too many people in public. So instead of having to go out every 30 days like you normally would get, you can now request up to a 90-day supply of your medication. So please make sure you do that so that you can um, practice, um, you know, you have safe practices during this time when you should be um, staying safe here, okay? Uh, and then the other thing is telehealth services tempor are temporarily going to be covered by HSA eligible high deductible health plans. So what does that mean? Normally, if you have a high deductible health plan, you are going to have some sort of deductible to meet. And telehealth services can sometimes cost money and be a part of this deductible. So they are supposed to be, um, now from what I'm reading, they're going to be temporarily covered by HSA eligible plans. So if you have an HSA eligible plan, which means you have a high deductible health plan, generally at least $1,300 of a deductible, um, you telehealth services are going to be covered for the meantime. Okay. So normally you have to cover costs until you hit your deductible and this will eliminate that. Right. And I think this might be it. Okay. So this, this is what I have for you guys today on for retirees. So let's check in on some questions and see what you guys have for questions. Let's see here. So if you have a question, go ahead and drop them down below. Um, let's see here. So Renate asks, have a covered Roth conversation yet? This is not what we're talking about here. There's no real changes about Roth conversations or conversions in this particular subject. Um, this would be a good year 
potentially to do them if you were going to be planning to do one this year because you can cover it over a little bit more. Absolutely. Um, but um, I have not, there's, there's nothing in there to talk about that. This is not a, um, that type of conversation. So, okay. So Kathy asked, um, my daughter is in college. She's our dependent on her taxes. She worked and filed her own taxes. Will she get $1,200 and we get 500? Well, you, you don't, you can't have both. You either, you know, you're either a dependent or you're going to be independent, right? So she's, she's going to file on her own and then she's going to get the $1,200 or she's going to be filed on your taxes and then you're going to get 500. That's what's going to happen. So if she was a dependent on your taxes, um, then you're going to get the $500. That's what, that's how that will work out. So I see a lot of people, I know a lot of people are trying to like avoid filing as people's dependent so that they can get maximize the money, but I don't know. I just feel like that's a little bit, a little bit off there. Um, so Patty asked a good question here. Um, am I going to have higher income because of a partial Roth conversion? Or I am going to have higher income because of partial Roth conversion. Probably $5,000 over the $75,000 limit this year. Will my taxes be affected next year? Uh, no. Your taxes will be affected this year, but you're not going to lose your... Um, if This uh, check is going to be based on your 2019 income if you've already filed or your 2018 income if you have not filed yet. So 2020 is not gonna have anything to do with it. So you should be fine for this year. It'll be based on last year, the year before. So if you're below 75 last year, the year before, um, if you have not filed yet, then you should be in good shape there, Patty. Good question though, really good question. All right, so that's all I am seeing here. So hopefully you guys, you found this useful. Like I said, I am gonna post a, um, a couple more videos, uh, hopefully today or tomorrow. Uh, talking about um, talking about you know things around unemployment and housing, and then I'll do another one on student loans. Okay, so um, if you have questions on that, then I'll, I will definitely make those two videos to talk about that. Um, if you're somebody who just you know you're thinking about retiring right now, or you're thinking about retiring the next year or two, and the market's down, things are going crazy, and you want to discuss you know getting a retirement plan together to see if you're still on track, or if you think it should be thinking about working longer or just really anything around retirement, you know, I would love to speak with you on a complimentary consultation. You can go to keepitsimplefinancial.com forward slash talk and uh, schedule an appointment there. I do have appointments for next week and the week after. So, or I should say this week and the week after, because um, I was going to go on vacation. Uh, I was going to do a speaking gig up in, um, over in New Orleans, um, but that's gone. So I had my calendar blocked off for a whole week. So now it is open. So if you want to schedule a call and discuss your retirement planning situation, if you want to get help with your retirement planning situation, then that's where you would go. Um, and I will put the links, like I said, to the, um, to my calendar and then also to the change of address form down in the comments here. If you guys need anything else at all, just reach out, let me know. Other than that, um, hopefully you're going to get your check. Hopefully you saw um, some benefit in what I talked about today. Appreciate you guys watching and I will see you very soon. Okay. Have a great day. Bye-bye now.